All right, be seated if you can. That's a challenge for the 830 crowd, isn't it? A good word. Sometimes as pastor, you get to make a request. And I said, Caleb, we got to do this. And I think he's really nervous about uh, that energy being followed by this energy. All right? And, uh, and, and we can do it. We can do it. So it's uh, oh, so much to be thankful for today. Let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 9. The Gospel of Luke chapter 9, one of the great challenges for me in the three service schedule is uh, knowing what to do uh, with singing. And uh, there's some thought, uh, you know, save the voice, but man, I hear the music, I just want to sing. And so across the mornings, just all three services, um, don't pray that I would not sing, pray that I'd have the voice to keep singing. And uh, that's what I want to do every time uh, we get together like this. Well, um, on this Sunday in 2000, I stood in the chapel to preach at Watkinsville for the very first time as pastor. And uh, so when I think about this day and I think about what the Lord has done, I have a lot to be thankful for. Uh, when we gathered in that room in August of 2000, there were about 200 people here that morning. And there were three college students, and one of those was paid to be here. And um, John Deans had identified a guy on campus named Michael Brock. He was a SIGEP, and he was a gatherer of people. And the church had uh, paid him a, a little stipend to come work with teenagers here. And uh, Carl and I came, and we were, we were here, and we really uh, had a vision to see our church uh, reach college students and it wasn't new to Watkinsville it just wasn't happening at that time in the 80s hundreds of college students came to know Christ came to be a part of Watkinsville the church was in multiple services on Sunday morning in that chapel and some of people who are in this room today across the morning came to know Christ or came to love the local church during those days and are still here there will be and most, uh, most likely across the morning today, there will be students here whose parents met and married or got connected to Christ and the church uh, during those earlier days. But in the fall of 2000, that wasn't the story. And there was a, I was a pastor here. We had a full-time secretary named Nancy Parks. And, uh, and so how are we going to? reach the campus and my thought was uh, get in touch with campus ministries who were reaching a lot of students and were doing ministry throughout the week get in front of those students and and say this say we don't have enough staff we don't have enough people to do what you're doing during the week but come Sunday uh, I want to ask you to make Watkinsville First Baptist uh, an option uh, for you to call home while you're not. And uh, I remember getting in front of several campus ministries in those early days, and I had my Bible and a box full of toothbrushes. You know, what in the world? Well, I, I was thinking a little the same thing, but I just, like, I know what we're going to do. We're going to take our Bible and we're going to give away toothbrushes. And I, and I stood in front of those campus ministries and I had a, a, a toothbrush that looked something sort of like this right here. Just a simple one of those they used to give you at the dentist for free when you'd go as a prize. And, and now they give you bouncy spiders and all that kind of stuff. But, but they'd give you a toothbrush. And, and I remember standing in front of those students and I would say to them, Every one of you Christian students, when you left home, your parents told you two things. They said, don't you forget to go to church, and don't you forget to brush your teeth. And we want to help you with both. And, uh, and so <laughs> you gave them these toothbrushes. And on the toothbrush, it said, make, uh, make Watkinsville a regular habit. And, um, and it just passed out thousands of toothbrushes. And, and uh, 
students started coming, and, and uh, I don't know if they brushed their teeth or not, but we would say for 23 years, let's open our Bibles, and, and I'm standing in front of you again this August, 23 years later, and I'm saying to you, um, don't forget some things. We said two weeks ago, don't forget to pray. Did you forget to pray before you came today? Don't forget to pray. Don't forget to connect. And this morning, I want to say to you, don't forget to follow Jesus. And you hear that phrase and you think, how could we forget that? How could we forget to follow Jesus? It may be the most obvious statement that we can make, but I want to suggest to you today that it's the most critical statement we could make. It's the most critical thing for us not to forget. A lot of people pray in this world, but they don't pray to Jesus. And you could hear the phrase, don't forget to pray, and you could pray to something. You pray to a tree or pray to a, another God. or uh, You could say, don't forget to connect. A lot of people in this world connect. They'll connect at a bar. They'll connect in an alumni club. They'll co connect in a fraternity or a sorority or on a on a, on a dance team or uh, over certain hobbies um, a lot of people connect in the garden club or in the Kiwanis club we can say don't forget to pray don't forget to connect but I don't know of anything we could um, that we could say any more important than don't forget to that we, fo we follow Jesus we're following Jesus and um Every, every one of us is following someone or something. Every one of us is influenced by someone or something. And in essence, what we can say is, is that every one of us is discipled by someone or something. In fact, you can't go through a day without someone saying to you, hey, follow me on, and it just finished the statement. Follow me on this website. Follow me on this page. Uh, or follow me at. Follow me, follow me, follow me. It is just, it is in our society. That is the phrase that we hear over and over again. Hey, follow me on or follow me at. Uh, you can't go through the day without someone sliding in on you influence to follow them. And we're either being discipled uh, intentionally or unintentionally, whether we um, are aware of it or not. And it's so critical for us to make sure that we're not, in, we're not forgetting to follow Jesus. Uh, I think about following things intentionally or unintentionally. You know that that is a part of our world more and more now. This summer when my granddaughter Kennedy was about four months old, we had opportunity to spend a couple of hours with her one afternoon. And I noticed that night into that next morning that as I scrolled through Instagram, all of my pop-up pop ads were advertisement for backyard playscapes. I find myself just standing in the window in the kitchen, just looking in the backyard now, just imagining this playscape uh, out there. What happened? And somehow, some way, you know what's going on. People are listening. Things are being picked up on. And I'm being discipled to buy a playscape just because of some things that have been going on in my life. It's actually much more insidious than that. Um, in the book, Following Jesus in a Digital Age, listen to this account. In the fall of 2021... MIT Technology Review released a story chronicling, chronicling a report from Facebook's research team. And it illustrated how troll farms had reached more than 140 million users on the Facebook platform in 2019-2020. Of particular interest to Christians is that these troll farms, often based in Eastern Europe, operated all 15, hear this, 
they operated all 15 of the top Christian American pages on Facebook. The largest of the Christian pages on the platform reached 75 million U.S. users monthly. 95% of that engagement came from users who never chose to follow the pages but were still exposed to the content crafted by these non-Christian groups. Jeff Allen, a former um, data analyst for Facebook, said that our platform has given the largest voice in the Christian American community to a handful of bad actors who, based on their media production practices, have never been to church. On a daily basis, millions of Christians throughout our society are likely being exposed to messages from troll farms which often design messages for higher engagement, financial gain, and to negatively alter one's outlook on the world rather than point people back to Christ and the gospel. And the writer goes on to say, people may spend five or six hours a week hearing from God's word, worshiping God with the church or in a community with fellow believers, but compared to those five or six hours, our phones, our devices are with us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. These tools are one of the most effective discipleship tools in a digital age. They are primarily being used to form us into people fixated on ourselves rather than to become more Christ-like. And so today I stand in front of you uh, to, to say let's not forget intentionally to follow Jesus. And in Luke chapter 9 we find the requirements for following Jesus. And I want to speak to you about the requirements of following Jesus and then share with you at the close the reward of following Jesus. And I think we're going to all want to know the reward to follow in Jesus because the requirements to follow in Jesus are so demanding. The requirements to follow in Jesus are demanding. Alistair Begg said the entrance fee to follow in Jesus is nothing. It's free. It's paid for. But the annual membership is everything. And the thought there is, is that to come to Christ, it is a free gift. But to follow Christ day by day by day means that we surrender all. We surrender all. In Luke chapter 9, you have Jesus making this all call for us to surrender all. Look at it. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And he said to all, it's not a wasted word. He's moved here from talking to just specifically the disciples to talking to the whole crowd. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. And then look in Luke chapter 9 verse 57. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, said to Jesus, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, 
but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. So what are the requirements for us to follow Jesus? In the first few verses we read of chapter 9, we find three of these requirements. And the first is to deny self. He says, he said to all, if anyone would come after me, that phrase, come after me, we, we, we use that maybe more often with the phrase where we might say, uh, going after. You say, I, 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 I tell you something about uh, that person. They are really going after their career right now. Uh, they're really going after that relationship right now. They're really going after getting in shape right now. They're really going after their degree right now. They're really going after school right now. They're really going after that sport right now. And in that, what we're, we're saying is this, that we're pursuing that. We're pursuing that career. We're, we're, we're putting our passion into it. We're putting our energy into it. We're sinking our heart into it. And Jesus says to the listening crowd, if anyone would pursue me, if anyone would come after me, if anyone would seek me out wholeheartedly, if anyone would put their passion and energy into who I am, here are the requirements. And he starts by saying, let him deny himself. The first requirement to going after Jesus Christ is to deny self. Uh, what, what is a picture of that? Listen to Hebrews chapter 11. You have the story of, of Moses and it's a story of fa the faith of Moses. In Hebrews 11, verse 24, it says this. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. That is commentary. That is illustration for what Jesus said when he said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Moses could have said, hey, look where I was born. Look how I was raised. Look who took care of me. Look where my connections are. I can just stick with this and I'll be fine in this life. And Jesus said, if you're going to come after me, if you're going to pursue me, you're going to have to look at self, and you're going to have to say no to self. Well, what does self do? Self is our flesh. Self has dreams. Self has desires. Self has things that we want, and we set our target on, and we go after things. Now, to deny self doesn't mean to go look for uh, any everything in life that's miserable and there you'll find God that's not the case now the world would want to make you think that the world would want to make you think that you're you're um, here's what people say hey we tell you about Jesus and the response will be back something like this well I got a lot of living I want to do before I come to Jesus I got to I got to Sow my wild oats before I come to Jesus. I got some things I want to accomplish before I come to Jesus. One day, I'll follow Jesus. Jesus said, if you're going to come after me, you've got to deny self. And here's what that simply means. What that means is, is that we don't make our decisions based on what self wants. We make our decisions to be obedient to Christ first. When you're taking journeys and making decisions, the most important question is not how much it will pay, not where it causes you to live, uh, not, it, the, the most important question for us is what's God say? It, it's not how, 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 how much am I attracted to this girl? How much am I attracted to this guy? The most important question is what does God say? What does Jesus want? What's, what is it when you take self out of the way, when you take flesh out of the way? Now, it, it may be the same thing. There's, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not always the case that what we want for ourselves is 
uniquely different than what God wants for us. The Bible tells us in Psalms to delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. But it doesn't start with the desires of your heart. It starts with delighting yourself in the Lord. And so to follow Jesus begins with delighting in him and denying self. It's obedience to him first. And I want to ask you, in your American Christianity today, in your Watkinsville walk with Christ, are you denying self? Don't forget that to follow Christ means that first we're obedient to him. Secondly. The second requirement is for us to die daily. The emphasis on daily. In many ways, you can say denying self is dying, but he gives this illustration. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and, what does that look like? Take up his cross daily and follow me. That picture, taking up the cross, was an illustration that Jesus used before he himself went to the cross. The expectation is is that when he used that phrase, that that would be a picture that would communicate clearly to the listening crowd what he meant. And when he said, take up your cross daily, they knew that they had seen the scene where people would carry a portion of the wooden beam that formed the cross where people would be crucified, where people would die. And he's saying, you're going to have to carry that cross daily to see someone walking with that beam down the streets headed toward crucifixion they were as good as dead and when Jesus said daily you're going to have to carry your cross to follow me that means that day by day by day by day you must count yourself crucified you must die daily I think of what Paul wrote In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The Apostle Paul, again, in many ways, given commentary, given explanation of what Jesus had said when he said, you must take up your cross daily. When we trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, maybe that happened in your life when you were 12 in vacation Bible school. Maybe that happened four weeks ago. At that moment when you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's um, positionally, You're justified. Your sins are covered. Your debt is paid. But following Jesus Christ, pursuing Jesus Christ, coming after Jesus Christ, it's going to show up if that is genuine in your life. If you've turned your life to him and you're trusting him, day by day by day by day, we must count ourselves crucified, dead to self. Someone says that the trouble with life is that it's just so daily. And, 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 and that's, that's what it is. It's we, we lay down to sleep. We attempt to sleep. We begin our day. And when we begin our day, the enemy is not playing catch up. The enemy is waiting on us. The enemy is coming after us. He is like a lion who seeks whom he may destroy. Every day we must die that day, take up that cross that day. The Bible says in Romans 12 to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to him. To follow Jesus means that we deny self. It means that we die daily. And then number three, it means we look to Jesus. The requirement for following Jesus is that we look to Jesus. To come after him gives that picture of looking toward him. He says, you must take up your cross daily and say that word with me. We must take up our cross daily and what? Follow. We put it in our sign out here. We put it in our purpose statement. And we often focus on the word 
wholehearted. We're making wholehearted. But what's the word that comes right after wholehearted? Followers. We're making wholehearted followers of Jesus Christ. That Greek word there, everybody you look to and say, hey, what's that meaning of the Greek word that's translated follow? It says to follow like being discipled by someone. That means is that we look to Jesus for influence. We look to Jesus for guidance. We look for Jesus to get our commands. We look to Jesus for him to tell us what we're going to do. We look to Jesus for our dreams. We look to Jesus for our satisfaction. We look to Jesus for life. And maybe if you don't hear anything else that I say this morning, hear this. It could be, this is what God sent me here to say this morning. You cannot follow Christ if he's behind you. You cannot follow Christ if he's behind you. We cannot go about our day, go about our fall, go about our August, go after everything that we're pursuing with Jesus back here and look back from time to time and say, now Jesus, take care of me. Now Jesus, stay with me. I'm on the go. Come on, Jesus, you got to bless me. I'm out here getting it. Jesus is just waving at us as we get further and further in the distance away from him. I want to ask you today, just this, is Jesus behind you or is Jesus right in front of you? Are you looking to Jesus? And the world is working hard on you to get someone or something else first right in front of us to just pull us along and lead us along. Are you looking to Jesus? It starts with surrender. It's at the first of the day when you're first conscious, you're able to make your first choice before you take your first step. It's you saying to Jesus, today, Jesus, I surrender to you. And then it's closing out your day when you say your last words before you close your eyes. It's saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done today and where you've led me today the requirements of following Jesus are to deny self to die daily and to look to Jesus Jesus following Jesus looking to Jesus going after Jesus it's more than a degree we, we, it's, it's more than a certificate it, it, it's it's more than a confirmation uh, follow, following Jesus is a daily death to self, looking to him, surrendering to him, letting him be the commander of our life. And number four, the requirements for following Jesus are that we detach from all earthly norms. I, I hope, I, I think that may sound radical in this room. I think if we're paying attention to this, if we're letting God's word speak, it's, it's radical for us. For us to follow Jesus, that means we detach from all earthly norms. Look at it in chapter 9, verse 57. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. And, and, it, and it, it reads like Jesus is reading them. And when Jesus responds back to him about following him uh, wherever he, he goes, what Jesus brings up must have been what he saw in that crowd or saw in that person. Because the first thing he says is, uh, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Uh, what Jesus was saying, just know this, if you're going to follow me, I want to have a house. I don't, have a, I don't have a nest. If you're coming, he's saying, if you're coming, if you're coming for the extras and not just coming for me, you're not going to find it. Sometimes we can follow Jesus just because of what we think 
we'll get out of it. Just what we might gain out of it. Just what we might, uh, and if I, if I go with Jesus, look at all the blessings that might come my way. Friends, maybe you don't hear it as much in this room, but you may be hearing it in what you're reading. You may be hearing it in what you're watching. Maybe the technical term for that is prosperity gospel, where there's this thought that, uh, hey, if, if I get Jesus, then I'm going to get all the trappings. And Jesus is saying here, look, when you, when, when, when you come to me, that doesn't guarantee homes. That doesn't guarantee cars. That doesn't guarantee comfort. That doesn't guarantee ease. If that's the earthly norm, detach from that. And he goes on and it says in verse 58, And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have no nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And then Jesus looks in verse 59 to another. He said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus has said to him, follow me. And the very first thing that the person in this, in this account where Jesus is interacting with people that the person says back to him, first let me. First let me. And the picture here is, is that there's some norms in life. There's some things I need to take care of. And then I'll get to what you want me to do. And I'm saying to you that the picture that Jesus Christ gives is that to follow him, our first can't be the things that we need to get to. And then we go to him. What Jesus is saying to us is that we follow him and then we trust him to take care of those things. It's, it's Matthew 6, 33. It's seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these things will be added unto you. Jesus says, preach the kingdom. Preach the kingdom. I want to get real specific here. I believe that there's some guys in this room you may be a teenager, you may be nearing retirement age, and God is calling you and he wants you to preach the kingdom. He wants you to pastor. He wants you to lay down whatever you've been going after and he wants you to pursue him in this specific way of calling to preach the kingdom, maybe to pastor his church, to prepare for some kind of ministry. And I want to say specifically to men, I don't know what it is. You, you just look at the numbers. When you, you, it, it seems so often when, when we make a call to missions, you'll have girl after girl after girl after girl after girl respond to the call. And you're looking around. You're saying, where are the guys? Where, where are the guys? And I, just, I, want to, I want to challenge you. I want to exhort you. I don't want to judge you. I just want to challenge you. I want to exhort you to look at your life and to be able to say that in your life you're saying, first, I'll go after what Jesus wants. Not first, let me do this, and then I'll get to what Jesus wants. It may not change a thing in your life. It may just change perspective. But, but what Jesus is driving at here is, is that we have to detach from the way the world would say, this is the normal way that you go after things. And then there's a third. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home and certainly this is hyperbole here. It's, uh, Jesus is making the point. He's driving home the point. Look, don't let other things take precedence over obedience to me. Follow me first. If following Jesus means anything, it has to mean that he's first in all that we 
go after. And so today, you hear those demands, deny self, die daily, look to Jesus, detach from the norms of the world. You might look at that and say, well, what's left? I mean, if, this is, if that's going to be life, what, it, what, what is the reward? It's, the reward is back here in chapter 9. And he says in verse 25, uh, verse 24, 924, here's the reward. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? The world wants you to find your life in what the world offers. Jesus says to us, if you want real life, you'll find your life in me. And it'll feel like you're dying to this world, but the reward is real life. It's real life. Don't don't let well-meaning intentions cause you to miss what has the most meaning. Every single day is a fight for life. That, that's what it boils down to. The enemy is trying to lead your life. In the Garden of Eden, from Genesis to Revelation, the enemy comes and he, and he comes to take life. And the work of Christ is to come and redeem us so that we can have eternal life. And we can know that life every day as we live eternal life. I've said it before, quoting another person. Adrian Rogers says, eternal life is not what we receive when we die. Eternal life is what we receive when we believe. Eternal life starts as you believe and you follow Jesus. You experience real life. Never forget this senior adult woman who went with me overseas on a mission trip. She really took me early days here at Watkinsville. And she said to me upon our return from that 10 days in Romania, she said, Pastor Carlos, I've never felt more alive than when I was in Romania. I knew what she was saying. She was saying, I just, when I'm there, I've just laid it all on the line. I don't know how everything works. I don't know what to, how to fix anything. I don't know how to make it happen. I'm just, I'm all in the arms of Jesus, and that's, I've never felt more alive. I, we got a text from a college pastor Saturday morning for something that what happened Friday night on campus from 10 p.m. till midnight, while most of us in the room were asleep. Some, some of our college staff and volunteers were on campus giving out um, Krispy Kreme donuts and, and ice cream to new students. And there's, there's your evidence of liberal drift. 23 years ago, we were giving away toothbrushes, and today we're giving away Krispy Kreme donuts and ice cream. But the, the, the quote for... For from the night was this. Our college pastor said, and he named the girl. I don't have permission to use her name, so I'm not going to use it. But at midnight, after doing that for two hours with students, she said this on Friday night at midnight in Athens. I think this has been the best night of my entire life. It's pretty simple. But somewhere along the way, I bet she made a decision to Detach from the Friday night norm in Athens and do something that had her following and pursuing Jesus, trying to introduce other people to Jesus. That's how simple I'm talking about when we're talking about following Jesus and laying down ourselves and dying to self and experiencing real life. Are you following Jesus? In 1865, William Booth founded the Salvation Army. 
he was, you think about the Salvation Army, your, your exposure to it may be just a red kettle. The Salvation Army serves 25 to 30 million people a year. Almost 3 million people volunteer with the Salvation Army each year. They have over 7,000 um, centers. They help people. They have over 1,200 thrift stores. William Booth, who founded that in 1865, was asked, how would you explain the impact of your life? And this was his answer. Jesus Christ has all of me. Jesus Christ has all of me. And this morning, I want to ask you, does Jesus Christ have all of you? The requirements are enormous. The reward is life. And you can trust him on the other side of obedience. Caleb plays. We've got a few minutes. Maybe God would move you to do something physical in this room to surrender all. It might be kneel in a chair, kneel at the front, put your head in your hands. It may be come and pray with me. Let's just seek our hearts, search our hearts.